three, two, one. Hello everyone, I am Chris Schmidt and welcome to Rocket Lasso Live. This is a live stream that happens every Wednesday for like eight months or so, where I answer your Cinema 4D questions, motion graphics questions, kind of anything that I can answer involving uh, this wonderful motion graphics world that we live in. Uh, I super enjoy it and the way this works is people ask questions from in the chat. I don't know what's coming up. I click on it, we check it out. Um, we see amazing work from artists all over the world. And we try and figure out how to to tackle different parts. Now, of course, my specialty, of course, is the technical things. But I'm trying to make things look a little bit more pretty when I can. Um, yeah, I'm really excited. It's a uh, it's 2020. It's a brand new decade. I'm excited to jump into some Cinema 4D R21. We've got Field Forces ready to rock, which should be super cool. And uh, I don't see any reason to delay and jump right on into the chat here. And I'm going to immediately switch to the screen and the tiny little me in the corner so that I don't forget to switch that over. Uh, also, uh, I know there's a couple people in the chat who have my phone number, so if anything goes wrong, please feel free to quickly send me a text. It'll be the quickest way for it to pop up and for me to know. I super appreciate that. Um, okay, uh, like I said, the stuff disappears really quickly, so I'm scrolling up in the chat right here. Here's my chat I'm checking out. So let's go ahead and click on this one from uh, MW, and it's popping open in Firefox, which is fine. So what are we looking at here? It is from Stefan Hulsen. Let's see what we got. Turn audio off from the computer. Okay, we have got uh, a 300 or a 36 days of type, and this is the letter B. But it is what we've got here is definitely a a stylistically. Um, it's cartoony, but the main thing here is that we're looking at different levels. We can see through multiple passes of this letter B. This is actually a pretty fun one. I think we might be able to tackle it. I don't want to re replicate the style too much, but as far as ta tackling some of these technical things, I think we could do something pretty neat there. So, good question. One that we can answer right away. If I didn't for everyone else who's been posting links, when I'm wrapping this one up, feel free to post it again. Just don't spam it. All right. Let's jump on into Cinema 40 R21. And let's see, when I work with a random letter and I don't know what letter it's going to be, and let's start with a Mo text, actually. Mo text, I like using an ampersand. It's just a cool looking shape. And the official font of Rocket Lasso is Futura. So let's so grab Futura Bold. Center it up, and yeah, that's working. I'm going to lay this flat on the ground so we can look at it from the top. And excellent. All right, so we've got that basic shape. It's going to be getting fed into volume. So, of course, in R20 and then improved in R21 is the volume builder, the VDB system integrated into Cinema 4D. I will begin with a builder and we feed whatever we want to the builder usually you just drop it to the child the main setting here as always is going to be depth set it to oh i'm sorry i'm in the letter of the the voxel size that's the key setting the smaller you make this the more you're increasing the resolution and keep in mind that you're actually tripling the resolution every time you cut the number in half actually you're not tripling it you're if i go from 10 to 5 it is doubled in every dimension. So it's it's times two times two times two. So you're, cu you're doubling cubed to add additional detail. Now, we would create a measure and you can feed the measure on top of it and it's going to make the mesh on top of it. I'm gonna be using keyboard shortcuts often. I'm gonna try and call them out. On the 3D motion tour, something me and EJ made sure to really press and I will do that right here. And that is, as you are learning your shortcuts, oh, if you want to get faster in Cinema 4D, you got to learn the shortcuts. And it's not like I'm an expert in every single shortcut, but anything you're doing repetitively, you want to spend extra time and focus on learning a shortcut. Now, the best way I have found to learn a shortcut is you actually have to click it. You actually have to hit the button. So here in Cinema, 
if I want to see my mesh here, you can do it by clicking on display and you can go to these different display modes. Now I could go to see this line mode here and I can just click on it and say, oh cool, it's there. That's what I want to do. But you can see right away that cinema is telling us the shortcut. The shortcut being NA and NB. Now, the bad way to learn a shortcut is be like, oh, it's NB. If I want to go to line mode, NB is the shortcut. And then you click the button. Don't click the button. Clicking the button is not going to allow you to start building up the muscle memory. What you have to do is actually type the shortcut. So you can click C that says line mode and be like, okay, cool. Click off of it and then click the shortcut. What that's going to do is give you the muscle memory. And that muscle memory is what is going to actually translate into going faster and faster. Uh, oftentimes, if somebody were to ask me, hey, what's the shortcut for this? I can't say it out loud. I don't actively know what it is, but it's kind of like I got this muscle memory with my hand where I can just instantly hit that shortcut, and that makes such a huge difference. So with that little aside complete, jump back over here. Now, we have run into a little bit of trouble in the past with making layers. I recall uh, also increasing my voxel size. We've run into trouble in the past trying to create like a thin shell and it seems like the volume builder doesn't acknowledge a thin shell, but I don't know, honestly, we just have to tinker around a little bit here. Tinker, tinker with various things. Uh, what's the best way to show this? I guess we should make this temporarily transparent. Now, I don't go to align mode often, but the shortcut is NG. So if you wanted to, I could NG right now and actually start memorizing that one. Now, what I li would like this to have is a thin shell. Now, we perhaps can do that by changing it to some different volume modes. Let me think. Now, if you, re the reason I'm, I'm hesitant here about getting a thin shell, and in fact, if someone... If somebody knows exactly the way to do this, feel free to shout out. I'm going to keep you, I'm going to keep an eye on the chat for a moment here. And to get the thin shell, typically we would just say, okay, let's make a thin shell out of this and create where I think it's under NURBS. Now, of course, I've written R21. A lot of things got rearranged. So underneath our kind of NURBS objects, that's where cloth surface lives now instead of simulate menu, which is a good change. I don't want to subdivide, just add some thickness. So you see that this is now a volume. We got a little bit of thickness here. There's an inside and an outside, actually a little bit of thickness, and it's hollow. The problem is if we take this hollow object and feed it through, you see that it's no longer a hollow object. It is a single mesh encapsulating the entire thing. So... Okay, and as a lot of people are saying, like, use cloth, but yeah, so you, you see the problems right away with using cloth. Inside of our volume builder, there are different settings, like there's optimize and close holes, but that doesn't seem to make any kind of a change. We're using the signed distance field. I'm going to try changing it to fog. That still seems to see, yeah, that's seeing the entire system. So... Yeah, this has always been a little bit of a pain. The, in the past, the only way we were able to get around it was poking a hole in the object. That just seems absurd uh, to do it that way. Um, Chad, yes, we could totally rearrange this order and put the final mesh into the cloth surface. Um, if we go back to the reference that we're going for, though, let me pull this up. You can see, I think that you, we can see that there's, there's, it's very thick in certain areas. So that I, that is a fine workaround. I just wish that I could keep in, I, I wish I could remember how and why that happens. I don't know. But in any case, uh, I do like that idea. Let's, let's uh, work around that. So I'm going to rearrange the order as Chad just suggested. And we will pull the cloth surface out and we will put this entire thing into the cloth surface. So that actually becomes a thickness. Actually, now that I think about it, that probably doesn't work because we need to make the cut through it and actually see the thickness. So we need the rest of that shell. Um, dang. All right. Well, along those lines, maybe we will poke a hole in this for now. I do wish we... I, I will figure out the what the limitation on that is. And now making a Motex editable can be a little bit of a pain because it explodes down to a bunch of objects, as you see right here. It's exploded. 
So there's probably a checkbox inside of caps. Actually, they changed it. There used to be a checkbox inside of caps for weld, but now there's the new type and that doesn't exist anymore. So along those lines, I will just hold down Alt as I create a connect object, which becomes apparent, and I can just make that editable, and you see it automatically gets rid of it. Another thing that I do, I do want to maybe poke Max on about is the new caps and bevels create all of the subdivision, all of the selection tags, and that can actually slow your objects down. And there doesn't seem to be a way of turning those off right now. Now, temporarily, I'm just going to delete that wall, and by deleting that wall, and we feed this in, you can instantly see that we are getting some different surfaces. Now, the actual hierarchy we want is the surface, the surface of the letter inside of the cloth. Now, inside of the builder, and now we can see N A being the shortcut. We can actually travel inside this. And we actually see that we have a nice volume here not not the smoothest way of going about doing this and this thickness is definitely a little bit clunky you see the way this expands if I turn these off the expansion of the cloth surface is a little bit ugly we keep that thinner maybe by shrinking that in a hair turning that on and we'll definitely want to add some smoothing the thickness here has become relevant because there is a thickness we have to make sure uh, we have to make sure that our voxel size is small enough to actually catch all of those shapes. And of course, we can create a smooth on top of everything, round out these corners just that little bit. But the thickness is going to be very, very specific. So let's go ahead and add some extra thickness on the interior. Actually, that's starting to, that's forcing it to be incredibly thick, which is a little surprising. Now, having done all of that, there's a completely different mode that I would like to experiment with here for a moment. And that is changing this from sign distance to a fog layer. If we turn on the fog, we have to use mesh points. The vo is it just the voxel size? Well, that's a little twitchy. Oh, okay, it's just maybe because I was dragging it. No, it still is really specific. The um, I thought fog looked at surfaces a little bit more specifically. I was hoping that would actually create on the surface. I thought fog did a really good job of that. Maybe it was just signed at distance field. I haven't tinkered with these in a little bit. So if we were to increase... Oh, you have to get really fat there to uh, make something pop in. Maybe it's this internal range. Ooh, I dragged that real small. Dangerous. Do, 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 do. Um... Apple, that's a that's a good point. I didn't necessarily read all of it, but that is a good point. If we, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, okay. You're right. Maybe I'm thinking of this wrong. I don't need the cloth. We don't need that thing we change. If I create a text, actually, we will need a cloth. But what we want to do is take this one and feed it through, and there's our shape. And it's probably a good idea to reset some of these settings to default. Uh, by the way, a shortcut that is very handy is if you right-click on the little the little arrow pointing up and down, it'll reset it to the default value. Very, very useful. So now if we were to create this volume like this, we can create a second copy of it inside. So along these lines, if we if if I create a They change it to, I think they used to be called something different. But if we create a dilate and erode, then it's going to inflate it, which is awesome. And then we feed the text in a second time. The second text, we say subtract, and it takes a bite out of the inside. I was thinking of that all wrong. So if we inflate that enough, there we go. And now if we hit the shortcut we just learned, and G, you can see that there's an internal volume. There we go. That's what we've been missing. Thank you so much, Apple. That was actually the detail that I was stumbling over. Now, there's, there's going to be a set thickness of how detailed I can go with this, depending on the voxel size. But there we go. We can actually see there's an inside and an outside. Now that we've got that shape working excellently, I will uh, increase voxel size to four. And now we can start taking bites out of it. So one way of taking the bite out of this, let's make a plain object. And A, make it plain. Let's make a nice color in here. We don't want everything to be white. Color, go to one of my favorite kind of nice dark teal colors, a little bit of an aqua. Take this plane, 
scoot it sort of in the middle. I'll even put it at an angle. Why not? Angle running right through there. T for scale. Scale this down so it's big enough that it's not going to escape. Perhaps a little bigger. So we've got that. Um, let's see. We can deform this in any way we want if we're being a little bit similar to what we saw. Uh, actually, yeah, let's use um, let's use a effector to do it just because it's a little bit different. If we click on our MoGraph menu, we will find random factor. Random factor can go into the plane. And we can tell this random factor that it should behave as a deformer. It should deform points. And the instant I do, it's going to explode all over the place. Along these lines, I don't want it pushing on X, Y, and Z. I think we just want it on Y. Nope, not Y. Third time's term, Z. There we go. By Z, now it's behaving just like a displacer would. Now, what's cool about the random effector is I, I've started using this in place of the displacer pretty often. Uh, it doesn't work in all places, but first of all, it calculates quicker. But the random effector, oh, it is on random. I thought that. Um, I guess when you drag a random effector, sorry, I'm getting lost in my own head here. When you drag a random effector into a field, it automatically changes its default to noise. Here it's not, it's just regular random. So if I click noise, now instead of it just being pure randomness, it is noise based. It's obviously got an animation speed and a scale. So if I play, this should be waving around and doing a pretty good... Uh, job of just creating a shape that is intersecting our letter here. So with that in mind, um, I'm actually curious, there, this might dead end, but if we drag our plane in, and I'm going to visually hide it, we've dragged our plane in, can we give this enough thickness via just this setup? Um, no, it doesn't seem to, so we have two alternatives, it put into a second volume, or once again, we'll just go with the cloth method, and we didn't get to use cloth properly before, so we will now. So we'll just take a look at take a look at this cloth. Don't want to subdivide it. Let's hit NB. We don't want to subdivide it this way. We want to add a little bit of thickness. This is a very smooth piece of geometry, so this should actually work really well. We'll do that. It's now a volume inside of our volume mesher. Let's just keep it clean. Let's drag this inside. Excellent, we've dragged that in inside of our volume builder. We want to delete this plane because that's not doing anything anymore. And now we've got our cloth surface, set that to subtract, and now it takes a bite out of it and it's hollow. Yeah, look at that. Good teamwork, everybody. Thanks very much. And actually, that's been bugging me for a while. Um, so that is, uh, that's important. Um, oh, another good point being thrown out there from MW is that we have folders. So we could create a folder here and we have our base mesh and some of that smoothing. Does that folder not want to move? Come on, folder. Well, let's find out what happens if I move this up and move that up and put this here. And can I move it now? Oh, very interesting. It doesn't seem like the folder itself is movable, but you can move things around the folder. So a eh, little bit of a limitation there, but we'll just work with it. Uh, anyway, the point being is we can put all of that into this folder, call this the letter, and we now know that that's the letter and changes will only affect that. All right, working quite well. This should be waving around. I've got the resolution pretty low here, so this should play very smoothly. So this is waving around. It's all live, of course, which is one of our advantages. We can make this thinner, set that to five, and now it's gonna get nice and thin. Excellent. I think that this entire thing would benefit from having a little bit of smoothing on top of it. So let's add a smooth. You got to be careful with the smooth because it can obliterate your mesh, especially depending on the thickness. So this one in particular, you can see that's immediately eating away at the overall thickness. Couple different things we might need to do there. Um, also, well, I'll fix that. Uh, FYI, my chat just auto logged out. So I'm going to have to log back in after this question is wrapped up. So I won't see any messages for the next couple minutes. Uh, okay, so that's smoothing out. Now, um, there's different modes here. There's mean. Let's crank that. But you see that also will explode it for a little bit. I like mean curvature. That one usually works quite nicely. And actually here, it is not exploding it so far right away. But if we increase the iterations, probably it would eventually. Actually, no, this one is maintaining pretty well. Eventually it does. But mean curvature, is a. it's definitely a good one to if you're just flipping through, seeing which one looks nice. I do find mean curvature works quite, quite well. Uh, excellent. So we've got the slice coming out of it. We're smoothing it a little bit. Of course, everything will look way better if we increase our voxel size. That is the primary setting here as we jump around. 
of course, when I hit play, it's going to begin slowing us down. It's down to about 10 frames a, a um, 10 frames a second, which isn't terrible. Uh, but I want to keep it running smooth for the live stream, so we won't put we won't make it any smoother. In fact, if we're going to make more layers on this, we'd have to uh, keep that in mind even more specifically. And you know, we're going to be getting even more detailed. So I'm going to jump it back up to four as much as I'd love it. But uh, this computer is already working hard. And let's make it a little thinner. Uh, in any case. And we can't go too thin, otherwise it's going to be thick enough that the smoothing and the expanding is going to catch it, I believe. So that is as thin as I can go right now. There's probably a slightly different setup we could do that would maintain that a little bit better. Now, with that in mind, we can always create a second volume measure. It's got the entire setup a second time. In this particular one, let's say we didn't need the cloth. Actually, let's make the cloth really thick on the other one. So that's going to be really thick cloth. Let's make a new material. Let's make, I'm going to make it this greenish color. So that one doesn't have a bite taken out of it. So inside of the hierarchy, it's getting smooth, but let's not expand it. In fact, I can just turn those both off. And now we've just got that one letter inside. So you can see that there's a letter inside of it that uh, is going to fill in the rest of the volume and the same this motion is just going to reveal it underneath if we want it to be fancy we keep on layering those things up even more so this is taking a bite out of the bottom one but if we rearrange our order a little bit and i want to simplify this so let's just look at this one what i'd like to do is shrink it and then take a bite out of that one so we get a second layer inside of that i will do that let's go step by step here here is our letter and that's going to get expanded Instead, let's not expand that. I would like to expand the next letter. So if I were to make another folder, which we can't move, so we gotta be careful, but we're gonna make a folder and put this inside, put the dilate inside. And my hope here is we get a second one and that's increasing or decreasing just what's in the folder and it's not going to apply what comes after. So with this in mind, if we start changing our offset, to in, instead of going positive, I let this go, start going negative. It's going to start shrinking it in, and this becomes a smaller inner volume. So with that combination, bring back our original shape. Tell this one to subtract from that one. If we erode this enough, there we go. It is now eroded enough that hit N G. We can now see that this also has an internal volume. Excellent. And... Mm, I can't think of any way. Actually, we could potentially expand it. Yeah, that might be fun because we're kind of playing with expanding and layering things up. We've got the same cloth surface. I think I would like to apply, and we'll have to turn it on to see it, but visually I can turn that all off. I'm going to drag this in down here as well because we want it to take a bite out of it. So you see that there it is, and we want it to take a bite. But if we make another folder, and man, it's so great that we have folders. Oop. If I make a folder in here, I can't move it out. So let's move out of there and make it so that folder gets created outside of that structure. Put that inside this folder. And with a second, can I control, drag these? No, well, too bad. A couple shortcuts. I. That's interesting. Nope, that doesn't work. Uh, I'll just have to make a new one. So we'll create a second dilate and erode. And we will start. And I will expand it. Once again, here's an offset, so we're going to make this bigger. Actually, oh, man, um, this is fun, but I did it backwards. This one should be thin. We want this this first one to be very, very thin in the way that it's seeing it. So we'll just leave this this way and subtract it. So we got our tiny one and the bites being taken out of it. And A, so tiny one, bite getting taken out of it. Let's view our second one. And our second one is also there. And inside of the builder, we're smoothing it out and the bite's getting taken out of it. In this case, I want to make a folder, put this inside, and then we'll expand this one. Man, the layering up of this stuff is, it's very much like the new field forces where there's so many possible combinations, it just gets insane. So I want to start offsetting this and inflating it. And you see that only this cloth is inflating. So it's referencing that original cloth getting way fatter and then subtract it. So let's visually hide that because we don't want that rendering. 
Um, interestingly, the text is visually showing up there. I'm not sure what I did to make that happen, but I'm just going to tell it all to hide. So, oh, very interesting. Do, 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 do. Hmm. Curious. Okay. Um, ba, 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 ba. Hmm. Turning off our second iteration. We're just looking at this one. For some reason, even though I think our hierarchy looks completely correct here, we've got a letter, and that letter should be showing up fine. If I turn off everything, yeah, cool, the letter's there. I'm going to delete the cloth surface because that's... Nope, not just delete it from in here. Nope, interesting. If I delete it, even if I click that and hit delete, it's deleting from the hierarchy. You want to be careful with that. So instead, oh, hmm. <laughs> How do I get rid of it? It's not letting me. Uh, if I right click it, there's no context sensitive options. If I delete, if I hit backspace. It's deleting it from uh, up here, which is a little bit weird. I'm going to copy and paste it because that one just doesn't want to cooperate. I can't help but feel that might be a bug, but let's plow forward. Great. Dragging in a second cloth surface. By making it invisible, is that stopping it from calculating? It could be. Very strange. Yeah, look, it's subtracted now, but when I hide it, Oh, that was weird. When I hit it, it wasn't working. What? I don't know what I did wrong there. And once again, apologize for not being able to see the chat right now. But now, okay, that is seemingly working. Let's see if we can get put it into the folder and see if we can expand it. Yes, there. I don't know what was messed up in the hierarchy, but now that has expanded. And with that expanded, with any luck, I can create the second one. And I didn't want... Well, I, I, this is external now, so... If I drag in the cloths, I, I deleted the one that it used to reference. So now if I create a duplicate of the cloth surface inside of here, subtract that. And that one's not expanding. So now it's taking a smaller bite of it. Oh, interesting. Um, something something with the hierarchies here that I, I can't help but think that there's... This, we're running into a little bit of a bug here. But you see how the voxels are not generating properly now because I used the same cloth surface in two different objects. The instant I added into a second object, the first one stopped working. So I'm going to hit undo. And you can see that's working fine. So as much as I don't want to, I'm going to copy and paste the cloth surface a second time, which now frees us up to drop, drop it directly in the hierarchy. And there. that's It just had to be copy and pasted for some strange limitation that was not referencing things properly. So... That was more complicated than it had to be. We should have been able to put that uh, basic shape together there in just a few seconds and not in a few minutes. But now you can see that we've got two different layers, two different thicknesses, both referencing, well, what should have been referencing the same cloth surface. Might have been able to make an instance, but I really don't think that we should have to do that kind of that kind of thing to make it work. So you can see how we start layering these up. A couple smoothing layers would go a really long way to cleaning those up. And of course, there's an overall sketch and tune look on this animation from Stefan. But I don't want to just copy that style, but we are getting the different thicknesses. It's pretty neat. I mean, you got some frontal projection here. And there, there actually, there is an outline on what seems to be a highlight. So that isn't so much of a sketch and tune thing. That might be a post effect is enabling you to create out, you know, like do a cartoony outline based on areas of high contrast. So I don't, can't think of a way to get an even line around a highlight. That would be uh, unusual. But I'll create, just for fun, let's go into, I'm going to go into our green material. Actually, let's go into this inner green material inside of, mm, let's go into the Fuse channel. Inside of here, there is a Sketch and Tune shader. And I'm going to create a Spot shader. And I, what, something I like doing with a spot shader that looks really good is there's some decent UVs apparently here. Like that doesn't look as crazy as you think it would. But we just got these spots. If we grab the material and say frontal, it's just projecting the dots dead straight. If we add a lot more of those, let's set the scale to 10%. It's not going to look too good in the viewport, but let's hit Control or Command R. Control or Command R. Now we can see the little dots appearing. It is currently being based off the color. What's um 
It's based off the camera. I just want all the dots all the time. You know, the way that this is warping and not showing up to all the different parts is, seems a little, a little odd to me. Hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, it seems to be doing something odd with the lights and shadows. I don't care about the um, the illumination or anything. Interesting. But, well, in any case, the, pro the frontal projection, I always love the way that the dots get projected onto it. But right now it's acknowledging it as highlights, which might make sense. Let's say include. Oh, there we go. That might have done it. Or not. It's not based off the lights. It's not based off the camera. If it's not based off the camera, look, it's only doing that. So, quite unusual. Do, do, do. Well, that's why I want to show you from the frontal. I mean, I, I suppose that was using the spot shader. If I want to literally go with a projection here, you can, of course, go with some surface tiles. Change this to circles one. Make that white and black and black. And yeah, as long as that's projecting. Actually, these are all black, black, white. There we go. That's the proper order. There we go. Then we get some nice looking spots. Uh, it's not going. It's going to be dependent on the resolution of your screen, the aspect ratio, rather. So these are going to look stretched out. But we could compensate with that via changing the the way the material is applied. Or we have U and V. I'm blanking out which one is which. But if we cut this one in about half. Yep, did it backwards. So we'll double that one. There we go. So they're, they're about square there. So you can compensate in two different places. And you get your spots going. And as we rotate, we can get the spots always looking directly at us. I'm not sure why the spot shader wasn't cooperating there. But I probably clicked on something that wasn't as friendly but yeah uh, the frontal projection on that kind of thing is just really fun and even as we move our camera it would if we were rendered it would look just like this where those spots are sticking right where they are and you get some really nice looking styles there the spot shader is based off the illumination perhaps and the illumination was in highlighting different spots in different places um so and of course the rest of it would be some relatively straightforward sketch and tune of of course, the tricky part there comes into uh, creating oh, there, sketch material. Uh, the tricky part there comes into choosing the exact style that you want to apply by dropping this onto our mesh. I can turn on just, where is it? Outline. I just want the outline. Hit render. And now you can see we get this thin outline going around the entire thing. Double click the sketch material. And based on that. Go to thickness, crank that way up, get a nice big thick line. The this is actually getting applied to everything because Sketch and Tune, they uh, Maxon wanted when you make a Sketch and Tune material and you apply it, they want to see it applied, so it goes and changes a bunch of default settings. So inside of Sketch and Tune, it's actually applying this material everywhere, so I can clear that. I only want it where I tell it to put it. Turn those off. Go to Shading, under shading, I'm going to turn that off. I just want to see what I see. The background, I'm going to turn that off because I want it to be whatever the sky is. Now, we're back in control over exactly what we're seeing. And I can see we just get the outline around the specific object that we applied that material to. Um, and then, you know, we, didn't, we didn't add all that smoothing onto our object. And I want to show you something that's kind of neat. I don't know how well this will work, but there's all of this geometry I guess it's not that jagged, but I want to see if we can smooth this out a little bit. We might, might not be able to. Inside of our sketch material, I'm going to go into strokes and let's see. Right now it's connecting the points as it finds them. I guess there probably is a lot of geometry there, so this probably won't work, but we'll give it a try anyway. So it's matching based on that. If I go to the store and say curve stroke, and change this to something very smooth. The smooth is being a B spline. I don't want any noise, and there's too many steps there. Yeah, I mean, it's smoothing it out. I'm gonna turn this off, and you can see 
Do you see how these are kind of a little bit more jagged? If I turn on curve stroke, it's going to start smoothing those out a little bit. But there's too much geometry to have it be super smoothed. But that is that's working. That's actually working pretty well considering how low the geometry is overall on it. And having a lot of fun playing with Sketchatune lines is fun. But that's going beyond the scope of the question. I want to get to more questions. So I'm going to save this scene file into... Episode 1, Scene Files. This will be Question 1A, Volume Byte. Uh, an important thing to note, save that, jump in the camera. An important thing to note here is if you are supporting me on Patreon at the engineer level, then I put all these scene files out on Patreon for you to dissect and reverse engineer. That's why it's on the engineer level. Now I need to log back in to the chat. Oh good, it's making me <laughs> look, it's uh it's I'm trying to I'm trying to log back in to a software that logs me out of it and is forcing me to answer the stoplight question. I have to do some picture identification just to see the chat from you. Here it's a game we can uh we can all play this together. Where's the fire hydrant? It's everywhere. Is it finally going to let me in? Loading, it says. Loading. I was going to say Restream does a great job of of sending... Oh, the request was made, but the re no response was received. Log in. Um... The Restream does a good job of restreaming it to multiple systems, but of course this time it wasn't doing it to multiple systems, and uh, the chat's been just not loading or working at all for me. So I'm going to be contacting their tech support when I'm done. Um, okay, it appears that the chat popped up. Hello. So, oops, something went wrong. Try reloading the page. Well, okay, now I'm only seeing your messages are popping in from here on out. So, uh, Bella just said, that smear looks fun, and that's the first thing I've seen. So, any questions have to be reposted again so I can get at them. Uh, Paul, could you automate some sort of model replacement to correct streaks like this in case of fast movement? That's an intriguing question. I'm going to click your link. Oh. Uh, this is a... GIF from the Lego movie, of course. I love the Lego movie. Uh, the second one's pretty fun too. The second one's a musical. Um, so you're asking about oh, you're asking about a model replacement um, for motion blur. And it's a little bit hard to see here because he's got Benny is moving the pieces, but you see when Benny himself moves, he just becomes this big streak. Um it's an interesting question. If we could do something, depending on if something, like, could we do this semi automatically? Now, I don't think they did this automatically because um, almost every, this is, even though it's 3D, it's practically stop motion animation the way they did it. And um, with it being stop motion, they just manually would make those models in, uh, on every single frame, I think. But with that in mind, I do have one idea that might do something. Um, how do we adapt the color? I wanted to maybe get some automatic color, and that might not work. And then they did they did very specific things with the way Benny's is going. Like I'm saying, like I. Their system was probably to manually make the model. What I am inclined to do would be something, I'm just gonna make a figure here, and I would like to be able to colorize this and have clones automatically adapt the color, which might be possible, it might not. So with that in mind, I'm gonna make this model editable and let's go all out and make a Benny Lego blue and a yellow Lego slightly orangey yellow. So we're going to make the entire thing blue, except 
his head will be yellow and his hands. Excellent. All right, so that is our start here. Now, my thought is if we make some clones. Now, if we could just make, I was just trying to think of doing it as a volume, but maybe that's going too fancy. Is it potentially just doing different points directly on him? I mean, the generic slow way, or the generic, ah, this wouldn't adapt the color, though. So then they'd have to be manually done. There's no way the spines would adapt the color of the surface. Let me think. And there's a lot, I have a lot of different thoughts of potential ways. And stylistically, it might do a lot of different interesting things. If we take our overall model here, and I probably have to merge these all down into one object now I think about it. So I'm going to, so holding down, the, I get the figure, holding down Alt as I make it connect, make it editable, and now it should be merged. Oh, all right, wind will nuts. Don't need that. So. We'll do this a little cleaner. So we got a model, apply second material. Actually, we can do that even better. If I select this entire mesh, select the hand, a polygon from the hand, from the head, and the, the other hand hit UW, shortcut for select connected. Now I just drag the yellow onto it. It makes the selection tag. So there you go, single model, all of that is applied. Now, this would be potentially a goofy way of doing it, but something I'm thinking is, if we go to simulate menu and we add hair, and did it change the, we need to change the icon. <laughs> That's throwing me off. Add hair. Look at this flowing head of snake hair. Um, so there we go. We've created a bunch of hair. Now, um, I'm going to tell the hairs to have a exactly one segment. This is probably way too many hairs. Right now it's creating one on each polygon of vertex. Instead, I'm going to say polygon area. So now we have very direct control over exactly how many there are. So I'm going to make it be not that many, a decent amount, but not of that many. So we got some hairs going. And then with a single segment, that means they're only a single direction. Under dynamics, nope, under forces, I'm going to get rid of gravity. We don't want any gravity. And then under, under dynamics, the dynamics are currently running on the guides and there's no steps on those dynamics so under hairs let's go to roots and say as guides which means there's exactly as many hairs as there are guides so these, these are literally the hairs under editor i'm going to say show me the actual hair lines drag that way up so we see every single hair so now even if i deselect those are the actual hairs now can we grab the material and say that I don't want any specular. Oh, we do need thickness, of course. And we're gonna make these super thick, set to 11 for now. Color, I want it from surface, not the illumination, not the shadow, just the surface. So how do we get, let me see if I hit render. Oh, well, yeah, look at that, not bad. So it's obviously getting a little bit darker and lighter. I'm not sure if this is completely replacing I'm going to try making, if we make this black, does it render any different? Hit render. Nope, exactly the same, so I think that's working fine. So we've now got streaks based on the color of the object. So with that in mind, it's a good step. I'm gonna go to thickness and let's make them a little thinner. That's to go, nice. So here's my thought. If we wiggle this around, and what's the best way to, I mean, I can just make it wiggle, but I'm trying to think if we wanted to like accelerate, decelerate, accelerate, decelerate, actually we can do that all with signal. Um, I'm just, you could do, I'm gonna use signal, which is a tool I developed for Grayscale Gorilla. Um, if you don't have signal, you could just use some regular keyframes. This is just a way of me creating random motion. You could also use a vibrate tag, but there's a couple of features in signal that's gonna make this a little bit visually better for us. So I'm gonna create signal. Currently there is a bug in Cinema 4D where vectors are not working. So I'm going to hold down shift and that's gonna force the vector to work. It's something that we hard coded into it. Uh, okay, cool. So now I can go to noise and with noise, 
I can randomly animate every one of these parameters however I want to. I'm going to jump to 1,000. I don't know if it's a big enough number, but let's say 1,000. And now when I hit play, that should hopefully be zipping around quite quickly. And it is. Now, that is pretty much exactly what I wanted. But I want this to zip and then slow down and then zip and then slow down. And what's great about Signal is we can turn on this checkbox called Time Remap. If I turn on Time Remap, it is no longer looking at the current frame to determine the time. It is going to look at whatever this number is. You'll see as I increase this number, it starts animating. So what makes that so interesting is if we make a second signal tag, I'm going to say this signal tag should control the time remap. So we're controlling time with a second signal. So what that means is I can drag to the spline to look flat there. And I'm not sure what the time should be. I'm going to say 5. And here's the thought. It's going to be flat and not move at all and suddenly go forward. And if I set my playback mode to be additive, it's looping, but essentially it's going to travel the spline and then travel the spline again, but continued from the previous position. So the hope here is that it's going to move along. Okay, it's taking a really long time. So currently our end point is 90 frames. I'm going to say it should be 10 frames. So there we go. Zip, 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 zip. So now you can see it's doing little bursts of speed forward it's actually working pretty well that's almost exactly what i was going for so now we got random motion moving at a iterating iterating speed iterating time now something that i want to be seeing and i'm not is these hairs to drag behind the model um and i don't like seeing these guides because i don't trust that that will be accurate so i'm actually going to lock the setting deselect it and now we're actually seeing the hair so as i hit play i'm seeing those hairs under dynamics, let's change some settings. We got properties, mass, hold root, drag. I want a lot of drag and zero stiffness. Nope, that's still not enough. What is root and hold? Oh, there we go. Aha! Okay, so now you can see as it's moving, the direction it's moving is creating essentially what looks like a streak right now. Excellent. Uh, I'm quite pleased with that. So now with that seemingly working all right, Let's use a little bit of Espresso to automatically get the velocity. So um, we can put the Espresso on the hair or on the figure. It doesn't really matter. Right click, programming tags, Espresso. The Espresso window open. We need the figure. Now, I think I think there's a position position velocity here. I never quite trust it. So let's see what kind of uh, info it's giving us. Position velocity. So with position velocity, if I create a text object, and there, there's different ways of doing this, but I like creating a text object, dragging the text object in here. I'm going to feed the velocity out into the text object, into the text field, and now we're just seeing it. So the problem with, yeah, this position velocity is giving us these big numbers, uh, and it's a vector. It's three different numbers. Um, there might be a way of getting the proper velocity from that, but that's not what I want. So what I typically do to get what I think is an accurate velocity is I'm going to grab. Actually, can we get it both from here? Because we have position. Yeah, we have previous position. So if I grab previous position and our current position, then we have two different positions in theory, one from the previous frame, one from this one. I'm not entirely sure I trust this previous position. Uh, I've improved it in the past, but let's find out. So we've got those two. Now we can search for a node, and the node is going to be the distance node. So I'm going to search distance, and here's the distance. I want the distance between its current position and where it used to be. So those are the two things that we want. And then output that. And now it shouldn't be a vector anymore. It should be a single number. And if this is working properly, when it moves, yeah, you see there's suddenly a burst of numbers when it moves. Now, I have no idea what numbers this is going to spit out. And there's really no way to know. We can just frame by frame. You can see that it that went about 200, and that's going to about 150. So maybe we're in that range if it gets up to about 200. That's just kind of a guess right there. But we can now directly use this setting and feed it into our hair. And with the hair, we will control its length. Hopefully this works directly. Because then we'd see it in the viewport really well. So I'm going to feed it into that length. 
it might work directly, but instead of doing that, let's right away make a range mapper. So I'm going to search for range, and there's a range mapper. The range mapper, if you've never used it and you've never used Expresso, is incredibly powerful. Uh, the concept is simple. The concept is, ooh, and I have to unlock this. The concept is when you have a range mapper, it's going to take the value of 1 from 0 to 1 and map it to 0 to 1. But we can translate this to any number that we want. So you can transform rotation into integers or time into rotation uh, and with any ratio. And not only that, you can do it over the course of a spline. But uh, currently it's just doing the range mapper, which means it's not doing anything. But if we hit play, let's see if we actually see something. Okay, so... Um, okay, you can see that it's zipping around and it's kind of just spiking out. And the spikes are getting bigger as it moves, but they're not dynamically drifting. There could be two reasons for that. One, every time it goes to zero, it might reset. So I'm going to say to output to, let's say, 0.1. So there's always a minimum length that it's going to reach. So it can't go to zero. Let me see if those can drag behind. All right, it does seem that by animating the length of the hair, it's breaking the dynamics. I'm not certain of that, but let's just break that connection and under the hair set the length to about 200 and now you see it does work so it seems like animating let me see we can actually probably just test right here you can see right now as it drags that we're seeing that trail but if i change the length every time the length changes it's suddenly resetting which is a little bit unfortunate there might be some ways around it can we mm, we can't change it on the cloning. I was hoping we could. So uh, our last, well, there's two different ways I can think of doing it, but the last option, instead of controlling it via the hair, we'll control it via the material. The material also has, um, let me select it. The material, oh, double click, that's what I'm missing. All right, uh, double click it so now we can see this. The, we can go to length or scale, but let's go to length. You see that here we also have a length of 100%. So we can control that instead. So here's our hair material. Drag length in. And now the range mapper does come in useful. I want to take a 0 to 1. And actually, we know that that's traveling and it's going up to about 200. So I'm going to go to about 0 to 200. And what should that output? Well, 1 is 100%. So let's, let's just make that assumption and drag that in. So that should be going to the full current length if that is um, is accurate. So the, the the part that makes me a little bit sad here is, oh, actually, is it, I guess maybe because we're seeing the hairs, it is, show, it is kind of showing it in the viewport here. Is this working? It's kind of working. Zip, zip, zip. It seems like when he travels forward it doesn't they're not rotating around in the other direction very well which is interesting if he you see he travels forward and backward and the hairs don't know how to rotate because they they don't have that direction now keep in mind the entire reason we're doing this with hair at all is it's gonna be really hard to frame by frame oh there you go uh, the reason we're doing this is you can see that the streaks are going to be created using the color automatically which is the reason that that is, that's the reason we're using hair. We don't have to use hair, obviously. First of all, our thickness here is pretty thick. Drop that down, down to 5.5 five and go frame forward. And yeah, so look at these really nice streaks. Like, I really like that. It's based on the velocity, so it, it should maybe be based on how quickly it's traveling. Um, so we won't be able to see this super accurately until we go to um, render it out. So let's go into our render settings, output. I'm just going to say all frames. Don't save it. Uh, that's fine. We don't need it to be too fancy. Let's just make a camera, become the camera, and go to animation tags, target, and I'm going to target the figure just so uh, just so we're sure we're seeing him. I mean, it's going to lose our streakiness a little bit. He's just going to look like he's floating in space. So... Uh, I guess I'll, I'll just go make another figure on the floor, so at least we have something to reference. Okay, not exactly fancy, but let's check the concept. All right, the first, okay, interesting. Yeah, see when it travels forward, it can't spin around. You know, zoom. All right, that rendered super quick. Let's see what we get.
Um, it's not working perfectly in the ways that it is working. It's working really well. Now, sadly, what, I mean, there's like a, a, I don't want to say an easy way, but a way that you could take this concept and do it in a slightly simpler way would just be to add a tracer object. I'm going to save this version of the file. Um, I don't even know what to call it. Um, Fake motion blur. Um, this is working decently nicely in the viewport, but obviously there's a couple limitations. The first frame doesn't look good. If it starts traveling back the way it came, it doesn't exactly know what to do with it. We could turn off the hair entirely and instead just use a straight up tracer. Conceptually, it's very similar. The problem with the tracer is that it's not going to adapt its colors at all. Trace paths. Yes, do the vertices. So now, let's get the figure. Here's the tracer. And, bah, bah. Oh, I put the wrong one in. So this is going to trace every single point of the figure as it moves around. So fair enough. Uh, we need to limit it from end. Let's say five. And now if it zips around, you're going to see that we're going to get those nice we're going to get these nice streaks automatically, and the direction is always correct because it's always tracing behind the figure. Um, even with him, tr he's traveling so quickly that it's not seeing every other, it's not seeing the in-between frames. You can actually get around that a little bit. It could end up looking a little pop. It could be popping a little bit, but we can change the spline type from linear to B-spline, give it some subdivisions, and now as it goes, it's, going to, it's actually going to create some curvature there, which is actually looking pretty good. It's not perfect. But, of course, this is not going in any way to adapt to the color of the figure. Now, um, there's two... There's two... The, the current figure is very straightforward, where it's just the figure and it's got two different colors. Um, sadly, you know, even if we were to apply the material from the hair onto it, it's not... Well, first of all, it's not seemingly seeming to render. Actually, it might not run... Oh, well, let's paste on... The, oh, the length is still being animated by our Expresso. So I'm going to delete Expresso, make sure the length is at the default of 100. Hit render. You're going to see that it's rendering, but it's just black because it, it can't get any information from it. it. There's no, It's not referencing the model as a surface. It's modeling the tracer. So there's no color from that. Now, we could easily get around that given this current model by I'm going to grab the figure, hit Alt-G, and put him into a group. I'm going to move the signal tags both onto the null and make sure the figure is zeroed out. We got the reset PSR button right here in the viewport, which is amazing. Um, all right, so with that in mind, we've got a tracer, which is working well. But we, what we need to do is create two different tracers. Now, I don't know if you can put a selection tag in a tracer. Sadly, you can't. So in this particular circumstance, we have to separate his head and hands as separate models. So I'm going to hit select it. Polygons already selected. Shortcut U P, which is disconnect selected. And then I'm going to hit delete on the original model. So now here is yellow and here is blue. So we don't need that there. We don't need this here. And we don't need any selection tags. And we don't need that. Okay. So we've got that going. So we can just name this tracer blue. Make a copy of it and name this one Tracer, 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 Yellow. Excellent. And with that in mind, yellow traces yellow, blue traces blue. And we can even see this in the viewport a little bit if we want to by turning on the basic tab, turning on display color. This is, I think I'm on the blue one. I'm not certain. Make it blue. Uh, did I have them? What did I have selected? That's on the wrong object. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to grab the blue tracer. Turn that on. Go to blue. Go to yellow tracer. Turn that on. And go to a nice orangish yellow. So now, if they're not selected, if they're not selected, you can see we'll get these streaks automatically. And that's looking, that looks pretty cool. I like it. 
Zoom, 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 zoom. Um, and you even see that in viewport. And if you were to put a tracer with a blue material on it, you'll get the blue material. Um, we could also, I mean, keep in mind, this won't render like this, but it would, um, you could put it into a sweep and sweep actual geometry. And that would of course render, or you could put sketch and tune on it, or we could put a hair material on it and that will automatically go. In fact, this is supposed to look at the color of the object. So I wonder if that would, uh, no, sadly it doesn't take the color of the spline. Too bad, so sad. Uh, the other advantage here, of course, is that this is always tracing all of the time. So we didn't even have to do anything to set a length on it. I'm not even sure if you could animate the length very well in there. I mean, I think it's doing a fine job with what we're doing and you'd only be doing a very specific frame. So I think the concept is pretty much there. Some of my other ideas had been um, uh, extensions of this. I mean, there's so many different potential ways. Let's go and save this as the next version. Fake motion blur uh, with a tracer. Uh, the other thing I've been going to suggest would be placing things a little bit more manually because, I mean, stylistically, obviously, the Lego one, it's all Lego. We're seeing Lego, so that makes perfect sense. Um, but if it's not Lego, then what is stylistically, what is it that you're going for? So I was going to do something a little bit more specific where let's create a rectangle, extrude, put the rectangle in the extrude, T for scale on the rectangle, make it really tiny. Make the extrude a lot longer, 100. So now we've got this long extrude, make it the color yellow. And just by taking that and placing it inside of the character, if I place this very specifically and awkwardly, where is it? Oh, there. Where is it? Oh, whoops. I was moving. I was in polygon mode, so it wasn't moving at all. I can hit uh, Shift S to turn on snap, and then boop, snap them to his head, and then turn off snap, and now it should be pretty much there. Uh, so anyway, you know, we could just take it and manually put the you know, a series of these exactly where we want them to be and make those aim at some sort of trailing tail. You can even build a fairly simple rig to do that sort of thing. So let's see, make a null. Let's, I'm gonna name this extrude one. Take this null, name it trail one. It's gonna trail behind, right click. I guess we wanna be specific, we can say spring one because we're going to right click and add The rigging tag, constraint, spring, we're adding a spring. What does it want to do? It wants to get to the position, the position of, not the rotation, the position of what? The position of the extrude. It's always trying to get to the extrude. A length, what length does it have? It has a length of zero. But what it does have is it's going to be constantly following behind. So it's trying to catch up. Let's turn off our tracer. You can see you can see that this null is always falling behind. So it's got lots of drag and we can give it lots of stiffness. So this is always trailing behind. So that gives us a direction. This direction, and we want to do an order of operations here. I want to move this down because I want to calculate after the movement and these are calculating on expression zero. This is also on expression zero. So it has to be after, otherwise it lags a frame behind. Now on the extrude, we can add another rigging tag. Actually, yeah, we'll just add an animation tag and I'm going to say, yeah, now it's a target tag. Just simple. I'm just saving a few few clicks by doing it. Tell it to look at the spring tag and this time because it's it's higher in the hierarchy, I have to go into our basic tab. Actually, it's set to I forgot. Target tags are set to expression 10 by default, so that actually will automatically work. So that's always looking at the spring null and the spring null should always be falling behind. So as this moves around, I think that it'll do a pretty good job of trailing behind. We have a lot of settings here. We've got the drag, but we can probably crank that stiffness up pretty high. We don't want it 
we don't want it wiggling though. So let's add a lot of drag. Mm, like that's wobbling around all over the place. The stiffness, a high stiffness might be bad. We want it to settle very quickly. So maybe just a lot of drag, a lot of drag, and a lot of a decent amount. Yeah, there we go. Now it's now it's doing a good. I just fiddled around. We have a lot of drag and a little bit of stiffness. So now you can see it's doing a pretty good job of chasing behind it constantly. Uh, I'm gonna exaggerate this at T for scale, so you can. Oop, I guess I shouldn't do that while it's animating. So you can see this log is always following the head and it's always lagging behind because of that null that's always trailing behind it. And now we could use that same velocity we did with the Expresso and then have that log, the stick, get longer or slower based on how quickly the character's moving. What's great is you could also set a threshold. You can always set a threshold to exactly or you can give it a clamp so it only shows up given certain conditions. What I'm going to do is pull the Expresso in. I, I like these little technical -y ones. So I'm going to go back to this first one where the Expresso wasn't deleted yet. Copy it. Close that file. I don't need it. Paste it. Steal the Expresso onto the Extrude. Delete that. Cool. That's just to save us a few clicks. So what position do we care about? The velocity. We care about the null, which is just a character flying around. Then we're calculating the distance. We don't need the text anymore because we still know the speed's about 222 and we're driving not the hair length but the extrude length specifically the extrude object property movement z <laughs> that's what we're controlling so the range mapper is currently going to zero but uh let's have it go extra long and say four or four four so it's about double what the other one is so in a straightforward way now yeah oh man look at that that looks great zip 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 um, look, oh, and when we, re when we reset to zero, it's going to kind of pop and explode um, because it, it still has a reset. So we'd have to manually tell it not to do that, which wouldn't be too hard. But that's actually pretty good. That's not bad. So you make a really simple rig that does this concept. I'm going to turn on luminance. Let's just make a luminant yellow to be on the extrude. So now you get this perfect zip traveling behind now just because why not uh, I actually have a tutorial I recorded that I haven't released yet that I'm going to talk about this concept but we can set certain conditions to happen at certain points so we can do that here the condition and this is just why not we're you know hopefully you're getting some good info here and if we make this little rig I think we can copy it to some other places so that uh, what's the problem I'm trying to show you here? Right now, if it's traveling, if we suddenly reset to zero, it's going to get super long. And the reason it's getting super long is because it's calculating where did the previous position, what 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 was it? And it traveled a lot. So it traveled all the way from there to there just because it jumped time. So we have to tell it not to do that. So we have a couple options. One, we could just say that position zero is... Man, there's like, I can think of like four different ways of doing this right away. Um, the main one being is we need to know what time it is. So I'm going to search for time. So by searching for time, we get a time node. Currently, it's outputting time. I like getting rid of the time, double-clicking it, and adding frame instead. So that's exactly the frame number. Now, I'm going to, in this case, let's make a condition. So I'm going to search for condition. So here's a condition. The frame, oh, and, uh, I guess we also need to compare. So let's search for compare. So, the frame is being fed into this compare. I'm going to say, when it equals zero, this compare is going to output true. Now, I always mix these up. I'm going to put it in. I think this is true and false. True, false, true, false, but I'm not entirely sure. So, when it's zero, it's true, which means I want it to output. You know what? I'm just going to completely guess. I don't know which port I'm supposed to put that in. So, I don't know if this should plug into there, here, or here. So that's outputting the number. So I'm going to say on frame zero, if it's true, output one of these nodes. One of them is zero. The other is whatever the velocity is. I don't know if I did the right one. So let's hit play. And now you see it doesn't seem to be working at all. So I'm guessing I did it backwards. So I'll just swap that over to that one. So now we should see he's got this nice little tail. But when he's all the way over there, if I rewind to zero, it's not there. Because at the time of zero, it has to be zero. And as soon as we refresh, then there's position has gone from zero to zero which means it's all working really well so now we get the streak and it doesn't reset at zero so that is working very very well quite pleased with that and um, so let's save that before i lose it and what should be extra nice in this rig um, 
That's not how we spell extrude. What should be extra nice with this rig is how easy it should be to copy and paste it. Although it would be nice if we didn't have to. I'm trying to think of there's any way we can avoid that. We can't make this. I can't make this spring a child of the extrude because we couldn't copy and paste it. Which means, given the current rig, let's clean this up a little bit. We don't need that. We don't need that. Don't need that. Don't need that. Don't need that. Uh, given the current rig. We have to, when we copy and paste, we have to make sure we grab the extrude and the spring at the same time. Another important thing to note is that if I'm going to be copying and pasting this rig, we do indeed have to copy and paste. I cannot control, I can't control, or command on the Mac, I can't control copy this because sometimes that will make it so that these tags are still referencing the original object. So you'll see here that because I control copied the spring, if I look at its tag, it's actually still looking at extrude one, and extrude one is the other one, so that's no good. So if you want to do, if you want to copy this kind of rig, what you have to do is copy and paste, because it's copied to the clipboard and pasted. It's only referencing itself, so that means that when I click on this one, that the extrude, well, I didn't rename them, but if this one was indeed extrude two, you can see that my extrude, my target is indeed extrude two. So that's all I was trying to get across. So it doesn't really matter we put that, uh, the spring. I mean, if we're saying organized, we want to rename everything. I'm not going to be too organized. Let's just uh, let's just put a couple of these on his hands. I'm going to hit Shift-C. I'm sorry, Shift-S to turn on um, snapping. I'm going to paste again. Grab this and move it to the other hand. Not being overly accurate here. Organize again. Did not really rename. But now we got three different ones. Uh, the velocities are all being calculated at the same time, if we were being clever, we could have the velocity be calculating on a world position based on exactly where, let's say he's spinning, then one hand should stretch more than the other kind of thing. But right now it's just based off the global movement. So, but now we do get three streaks traveling around. Um, right now the length is, I shouldn't have, uh, I shouldn't have made the length double this range mapper is actually not doing much right now. I think the velocity, the distance it travels is exactly the length we want it to be. And unfortunately, oh man, the tutorial I made is would address this kind of stuff exactly. But we've made three different rigs, which means any change we make, we have to make the change three times. But now we've done that. So now this should be exactly making the motion blur as long as the character has traveled. And what's cool about making these types of automatic rigs is, of course, we can go back in and change the base animation, in this case, signal. I'm going to say it should travel 10 frames forward, so it's going to travel twice as fast. Yep, yep, yep. Or you keep that same speed and tell the random noise to double its power. And we can even go zero on Y, so that's just on the ground. Yep, 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 yep. So... There we go. Three completely unrelated methods for creating some motion blur, some faked motion blur on really anything. Um, and depending on, well, it's pretty cool. I do like it. Yeah, it's fun. So we'll give that one another save. Thanks so much for the question. That was a good one. Um, let's jump back into the chat. Um, my chat only crashed two times on there, but I was able to log back in quickly enough. I didn't even have to call it out. Uh, Meeks, any idea how to make these? Uh, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks. I, had, uh, I forget how to pronounce that again. I'm sorry. So thanks, Dim. Uh, we, I think we will have a good season too. I'm enjoying myself. Uh, hey Leo, how's it going? Who else do we have show up? Uh, Crossfaders chatting away. Ooh, Mr. Yeah, welcome. Thanks so much for coming in. Um, you do have a question there. I started calling out one person. Uh, once again, especially for everybody who's just showing up now, apologies. I don't get to get to every question. I tend to jump around. Um, hopefully over the course of all the m weeks and months of answering things that we do get to the questions. Uh, and depending on the week, we try and do a whole bunch of questions. Sometimes we focus on just one or a couple, depending on exactly what we're doing. But I already said I would check out WS Meek. So let's try that one. We'll see what we can see there. Share the screen. What do we got here? We've got a crazy real life sculpture from Hanzu, 
Hanzu Tung. Uh, whoa, crazy. Any idea how to make these is the question. Mm, I mean, really, it's it's taking the model and slicing it up and just scooting it a little bit. Seems to be what it what the main idea here is. So, honestly, well, it depends on the different ones have different looks. Um, but let's, let's just look at this ear as a example. I think that a basic version of the, this technique does not have to be all that difficult. Open a new file, and um, do we have any handy dandy models? Let's uh, open, and I think inside of the live shows, I have a models folder. Oh, <laughs> it's just the giraffe. Uh, okay, the giraffe works. So we had. Uh, Actually, the draft doesn't work so well because that was something downloaded from Turbo Squid, which means I can't set, I can't share it with all of you on Patreon. And I don't know if I have the proper model. I don't. I need some. I need to get some more nice models. And I didn't download the entire catalog. I think I downloaded some of it, but I don't see all the sculpting base meshes. So apologies that I don't have a fancier model to work from. But I won't be able to share. We'll keep it simple. I will make a sphere. Change it to icosahedron. Jump this up to 64 segments just to make a whole bunch of them. And displace it with a displacer just to get a shape that's a little more interesting. Intensity 25, shading, noise noise oh, make that stronger go into the shading increase our global scale until we get something semi-consistent looking nice I guess we can displace it even a little more okay cool doing something as simple as that we've got not exactly a fancy mesh but a mesh nonetheless now it's actually incredibly straightforward I can um, make a Voronoi fracture, feed this into the fracture, and now it's breaking apart into pieces. Of course, if you're familiar at all with cinema, I'm sure you've played with a fracture. It's really cool. Something you might not know, you probably do, but you might not, is we can delete the point generation, which right now is saying how many chunks that there are. I'm going to say, get rid of that. I don't want that. And we can feed this anything we want. In fact, it's really cool to feed the same model in that you're starting with, and you see you get these really cool like hexagon patterns. But in this case, I want a series of horizontal slices. And the easiest way to do that is create a matrix object. The matrix object, I'm going to say that, yes, indeed, it is a grid, one by one by one. And now on Y, I'll start increasing this. And you can see I got a series of these. Now, keep in mind, the way a Voronoi fracture works is it creates, let me put some points back in there because it's worth explaining. If we add another random one, what it's doing, and you can see if I select it, it has generated a couple of random points in between here. So what it would be doing is, let's say, let's go to a side view here. Let's say that we create one random point. Let's say there's two points. So there's one here and one there. The way Voronoi fracture works is it would create, let make a, actually, let's just use this matrix because we can see it. So what it does is it, calculates those two points, finds the halfway point and the direction that's facing, and essentially it is going to create a slice in between those. So it creates a slice in between the halfway point. Now you can imagine if I made another point it's referencing right here, then it's going to find all of its neighbors that within are within a certain range and make a cut there. So this is the halfway point between those two, and the direction that's facing is that way. And But there's also this distance here where it's going from that point to that one. So to actually make another cut right there, and let's orient this to be in between those two. Now, this one actually intersects there. So the way it would actually cut would be it would only go up to that point. And that's how a, and in fact, yeah, this one would technically pull over there. And I think even, yeah, this one would pull there because as they pass through another slice, they would terminate. So you can see how these start subdividing. That is what is happening one, you know, step by step by step by step. So now if we just grab our one matrix, reset its PSR. So now you can see that we've got a series of little clones, 
little steps and each of those is going to become the reference but they're all in a straight line so them being a straight line if we drag that in as the source it's creating now a slice at the halfway point in between every single one of them and since they're all lined up we get perfect horizontal slices awesome and super easy barely an inconvenience let's turn off colorize fragments and now we've got this all sliced up even though it doesn't visually look like it and easy peasy we can create an effector um i actually like using the formula effector for something like this but let's not use a formula effector why use formula effector when you can use fields um do we want random or plain no let's use plain plain is, you can make anything out of a plain def of a plain effector now so let's have these off i'm gonna offset these on z let's just offset them 100 percent and uh okay cool so it's just applying everywhere now a fall off is needed go to fall off it is a field now and we can create this in two different ways i'm going to make a formula field and that's going to look pretty cool i don't want to colorizing anything so we'll turn that off it's going to look pretty funky there but you do see the individual slices slicing there but uh we should be able to simplify this quite a bit we got this big crazy equation but i i always forget the the, the if it's like a colon or a semicolon but I'm going to type in mod, which is short for modulo. And is it a bracket? It's either a bracket or parentheses. I'm trying to guess, and I really shouldn't guess. So you know what we can do? If you don't know what the formula is, you can right-click, and we can say show help. And it's going to pop open our wonderful online help that we no longer have to download, which is wonderful. And then here's a list of possible formulas. So we click on that, and here's the wonderful page. I am looking for... Where is it? It's got to be over here. Nope. Mod. There. Oh, okay. It's parentheses. Parentheses. A. Semicolon. B. Okay. That's all we need to see. Is this is modulo. So. Mod. Parentheses. And then we have our ID, which is just the current ID of the clone. Semicolon. Two. Close parentheses. Bink. Um, let's see if I did this right. I don't think I did because we'd be seeing something. So maybe I did that backwards. Let's say mod two ID. Oh dear. Huh. What did I do wrong? I thought that would work. What did I do wrong? I honestly don't know what I could have done here. It should it should take the ID of the clone, modulo it by two, which oh what did Okay, I must have clicked something wrong because then I just typed it in exactly as I thought I had. I guess I can always go check the tape. But anyway, that's what you need to do. Mod parentheses ID semicolon two parentheses. And all what that is now saying is every other clone. That's all it is. That's all like as fancy as it all that had to be. This just means every other clone. You can do something like type in three and now every third clone is affected. But that's not what I want. I want this. So, with that in mind, every other clone is being affected by this plane effector, so I can scoot every other slice just a little bit. And I think that's pretty much all we have to do to make that work. Now, of course, this is Cinema 4D and not some wooden sculpture, so we can always add in a little animation speed and have this be wiggling around. Actually, it's popping. It's unfortunate, but it's popping because... As it's wiggling around, it's creating a new slice or, yeah, sometimes a slice exists and sometimes it doesn't, which is forcing the formula field to make it look like it's popping just because it's existing and not existing. So just for fun, um, we'll turn off the formula field and an alternative that we can do would be in the fall off. Let's see, what's another? There's a lot of different ways we can do it, but let me think what the best way would be. I'm thinking shader, but shader needs to line up. That's a bit of a pain. Uh, 
I, but I think it is the best option if you need it to be absolute. I mean, we can always, like, you just say, like, random field, and you can see they'll randomly be offset, so obviously that doesn't take any any effort. What's what's cool and interesting is we have this random field, and uh, let me, um, okay, there it is. Uh, let me finish my thought. Uh, we are randomly moving them. They're not animated. Actually, this might be animated. Yeah, right now it's set to noise. I'm going to say just random. So now, if I were to chill out our displacer. Hey, displacer. Chill out. There, it's not animated. So now instead of them being pushed specifically over every other one, now it's just a plane effector doing its thing, but a random effector saying how much the plane effector should apply, which is an incredibly powerful concept. So we have the ability to set a min and max value here. So we could start increasing the max. Mm, yeah, we can increase the max, but we have to go into the plane, fall off, and turn off clamp. I don't want to clamp. This clamp checkbox here means that no number can go below zero or above 100%. So by doing that, we can go into our random field. I believe I can grab my min and push that more negative and grab our max and pull it more positive. And now we get these random offsets. And... Actually, these might be based off the index, so I wonder if they would still pop in and out of existence. Let's find out. Oh, dang it. Look, they're still popping in and out of existence because of the exact same reason. There's, It's looking at the index to see how it applies it, but the random field allows us to get around that by instead of viewing these based on random, which is looking at their index, I can say look at them based on a noise. Now, this noise is going to make them wiggle. And it's going to make them animate, but if we set our animation speed... Actually, animation speed is zero. Random noise, purling, field, global. Why is it animating? Why is it animating? What's color shift to do? This... This is really weird. Huh. That animation speed. Surely that's not. Oh. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. This is getting fancier than I thought it would. But. Okay. Yeah, man. I spend way too much time in Cinema 4D because. I thought this would automatically work. And the reason I thought this would work is this is now sampling based on its position. It's based on its position and not based on its count number or its index. So as they appear and it disappear, it shouldn't make any difference. And you see that it is true. They're not popping, but they're all animating. Why are they all animating? Well, the reason they're all animating, of course, is, well, of course, a random field is like a big volume of noise. And this big volume of noise is sampling a position. And the position is at the center of one of these slices. And because the displacer is animating at the center point, the axis of each of these slices is moving around. Because that, you know, because that is moving. So we should be able to get around that by I think zeroing out here's X and here's X, Y, Z. If we zero out X and Z, then those become infinite. They're, they go, actually, we can't go down to zero. I don't know if that will work. Oh, it doesn't go to zero. So we'll have to go really, really big instead. Can't go small. We have to go big. There we go. All right, well, at least my theory was right. So I made these cartoonishly huge. So essentially, you can imagine that we're taking this noise, this like three-dimensional noise, and I just stretched it stretched it super far out practically to infinity which means even if this axis is shifting left and right like up on you know on x and on z th the cloud of noise it's in is so stretched that it's not changing its number because it's so far away now typically you'd want that to go down to zero but apparently the random field is not allowed to go down to zero even though a regular cinema noise is so we just stretch out really big um so there we go now they're randomly sliced um which is all I was trying to do. And you'll see that if we turn off this animation, that there should be no motion in there whatsoever. So there we go. Random movement. Sorry, that went uh, that went a little that went a little deeper and off the rails, but let's uh let's get another question in. So if I didn't get to your question, feel free to post it again. 
especially new. I'm going to try and answer a question from someone who's new this time. Fake motion blur. What do we call this one? Um, <laughs> what is this? Um, fracture slice. Fracture stacked slices. Do, do, do. Oliver. I didn't think Oliver is regular, but if there's nobody else popping in and you're here, then uh, let me see. Oh, and uh, yeah, I should take a little bit of time in between these and see if there's some follow-up questions. So apologies. I want to check it out. Um, so might welcome to the show. Um, from the previous extrude approach, there's a previous question. From the previous extrude approach, couldn't you avoid the lagging nulls by taking the velocity from Expresso and simply calculate the length of the vector? Uh, the lagging nulls are not having, weren't, um, so this is just for might. In the previous one, the nulls didn't have anything to do with the length. The nulls just were giving it a direction. It needed to know where it used to be to aim that way. So that it had nothing to do with the length. The, the velocity was what was calculating the length. Uh, so you're right about that. But yeah, those were just giving direction. And there might be a different way of getting the direction it's traveling. But I feel like that might get a little bit pop. It might start popping a little bit. So yeah, I quite like the way we end up doing that. Um, uh, Mike, I also recognize you. So I'm going to click on Oliver's question. Ooh, what do we got? Uh, this is from MT, uh, possibly MTI, but I think MT01. And we got some text, and it looks like it's going all to, whoa. Impossible. That's really cool. Um, whoa, that's pretty funky. All right. I'm gonna have to have my brain wrap around this one a little bit. First of all, okay, he got he got more. I thought there's only like one message. I was like, this guy deserved more comments on, or gal <laughs> deserved more comments on this. But yeah, plenty of views, so it's a it's a good piece. Let me think. Is it? It could just be traveling a circle and getting twisted. It could also be an impossible circle where it's, if you rotate the camera, that the circle isn't quite the circle. And I'm not going to know until we make it. Uh, Hey, Paul, uh, Paul, I think you're describing it as simpler than it is. It's it's not just that. Because, oh, well, maybe it does just stay there. But it feels like it's both in front and behind. So I think there's more to it than that. But let's find out. Let's find out together. Create an inside spline. Give it lots of subdivisions just to make it very circular. Motext. Good old Motext. We love Motext because it gives us the extrude automatically. I should just change my font to be default future because I'm always going to go to it because it's nice and big and blocky. Maybe not extra bold though. Maybe not that one. Condensed extra bold? That's what we're on. Oh, that one's nice. Right click. Uh, reset to default. How do you set as default? I haven't done that in a long time. Oh, uh, edit set as default. Sure, why not? Um, that's just a boring thing, so no reason not to change that. Um, so what do we say? We say rocket lasso live. And all right, so we get this big old text. Let's extrude. I'm going to extrude this more. And it's probably got to be centered a little bit better. Thus, I make a null. And I'm just going to eyeball it, scoot this into the middle like that. That way the null can be what is being referenced. 
And it's probably going to have to be extra thick. We'll figure that out as we go. Create a second one of these. Scoot it over here. Rotate it 90 degrees. Whoa, real sensitive there. There we go. Push this up. And yeah, definitely needs to be way thicker. Yeah, I guess it needs to be as wide as it is as it is tall. Okay, so we'll start out that way. Nice. <sighs> Scale that down so it looks like it's about the right length to be the circumference of a circle. Create the old spline wrap. Drop that in. This is along X, so X plus is perfectly fine. Feed that onto an end side. And here's where things, I believe, will get tricky. First of all, we'll scale this until it looks about the right scale. Now, I don't think just offsetting this rotation is going to do everything that we want it to. Um, let's make this linear. Alt, or wait, Control D, Project Settings, Key Interpolation, Linear. Key interpolation. I'm going to set that interpolation to linear so it's not smoothing in and out. Thus, I can say at the time of zero, this is at zero. At the end frame, that will be 100. In fact, it should be one frame even further than that. Oh, we'll just cut off the final frame. It's fine. Jump that up to 100, cut it off, and if we wanted this to loop, we now remove one frame. That way the last frame and the first frame are not literally the same, the frame after. So you see, this is where the impossible part comes in. You see how this is spinning, it doesn't look impossible at all. Like this looks really straightforward. It just looks like one piece of text that's working properly. And that's where this is clearly doing something different. Um, now, something that I think is maybe a little bit of a, well, not a giveaway, but you can see there's some deformation happening here. You can see the letters stretch right at that point. I don't see the, clearly the text is fed in these two different directions. That's not in dispute. Well, yeah, I think um, I think that the word is rotated 90 degrees because you can see you can see in the animation the transition. You see there it's on the top and there it's on the side. So there are two of them like that. But in addition to that, we have some additional levels. One, I believe, is and the letters don't twist. I don't. Ah, this is a tricky one. Well, my instinct is saying I don't know these kind of optical illusions too well. Well, I, I, it's very specific. I'm going to make a circle instead. And the reason I just went to a circle, which I almost always avoid, is because if I make it editable, I'm only going to get four points. So I got four points here. I can grab these two. Because what, my, what I'm thinking it might be going on would be select the point, select the point, hit R for rotate, Alt. I accidentally hit Alt D, which is a shortcut for turning off your axis. Very dangerous. If I were to rotate these, I don't know, at this point, I'm going to say 90 degrees. And then spin like it's like it's the kind of thing where you're gonna like take these points and spin them in perspective somehow. I mean that's obviously not right, and you can't just do it with a circle. But it's the kind of thing you know when you like when there's certain animations, not even animations, like in real life, you can cut a piece of wood so that from one angle it looks like a cylinder and the other angle looks like a cube. I'm thinking it's that kind of thing where from it's kind of like a figure eight but when we're looking at it from a particular point of view it looks like a circle but like what that shape actually is I have no idea um, and then I, I don't want to just do guess and checking on it because even if this was if this was say on the inside and we twist it there's a rotation here so we have banking if I bank it 360 degrees and we set this to linear. Then I, that'll do one twirl around. But you can't do that because it's it's twisting, and I don't I don't think the text doesn't get twisted in this way because that's not giving you that impossible look. It's very straightforward. That there's an element of this illusion where the 
Yeah, you see how this looks like it's moving away, and that looks like it's moving closer, which is the opposite of what's actually happening. Mm, Zach has a link to another post from the same person. Yeah. It's a probably a similar concept. Yeah. See, it, it, once again, we're getting to these impossible angles. This is this is the type of thing that's happening. So everybody was saying like, oh, it's just a twist or it's just turning. It's like, no, there's more to it than that. There might even be like it's also having to scale as it travels. I feel like I understand the concept without knowing the mechanism. It's really well done. Good job, uh, MT. Um, think, 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 do. I mean, the perspective is wonderful. Uh, Emilio has a link about possible how-to. Oh, oh, that is a, that's a brand new question. I thought that was for a how-to. Uh, yeah, I might have to bring him on as a guest. I, I agree. Um, so here's my... F oh, man. I feel like I'm so close to wrapping my head around it, but not quite. The idea is, I think, something along the lines of having two arcs. So if we have two arcs and they wouldn't have this relationship, but optically they'd feel like they did. So that looks like a circle. But truly what would be happening would be something more akin to this, but then bent and twisted so that this line is warped into the position where that one is, but, but in perspective, not literally. Um... And yeah, potentially it's also, I'm not sure if somebody's referencing this, but if you type, if I go 90 degrees, uh, strip that over there and scoot this here. So do something like that. So you see that they're actually traveling in space. And now if I were to rotate, see if I rotate my camera here like that, do you see how it looks pretty close to a full circle? But those are actually not in the same spot at all. I think this is more along the lines of what is happening. Um... Uh, well, a bunch of people are arguing over what the uh, the effect might be. Uh, El Gorendosit. Yeah, well, okay, that's just a list of those uh, twisty images, which is cool. Yeah, I mean, oh, yeah, that's the trick. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I might be onto something here as it is. Um, I mean, that's not perfect perspective, but you'd have to travel that spline, and then it loops back around. Um, I don't know. Let's uh, give that a try. And then, I don't know, it might be something worth doing a little bit of R&D research. What you know what we should do, uh, Crossfader especially, uh, maybe we should make a, I don't know if it would be on the live, maybe not on the live, uh, on the Slack channel, not in the live channel, but make a channel which is like conversations for following up on these questions. If somebody does some R&D or they figure out how it worked, then the group can dissect it and try and figure out how it worked or what the actual process might be. That might be kind of fun. Uh, but in any case, let's see if this theory works at all. I'm going to make those two editable. We're going to... I'm... I've got connect and delete. We need to... I'm going to scoot that way in the air. We need... 
I select these and join them. Join. So those are now merged. The only problem is if I delete that, it's going to change the curvature a little bit, but I'll just ignore that for now. Scoot that down. Yeah, this should be smooth. Smooth. Rotate just a little bit. T for scale. There we go. Pretty close. The, it also looks a little squished there just from perspective. We, we'd want to flatten out the camera, I'm assuming, so I can zoom out. We can actually go parallax, but let's leave some perspective in there just by zooming like that. There we go. Pretty dang close to a circle, but it's not a circle. That's the trick. Okay, now steal our text and put it in here. No twist. Delete. Okay, no twist. What spline? This spline. Oh, there we go. Sorry, that was behaving a little weird. Um. Now it's mode fit to spline. Is there a way to loop it around? Oh, I guess. Mm. Bounding box. Keep length. No. Fit the spline, mode, clamp. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not sure this makes sense, though. Um, so that is traveling around, but we need to repeat it somehow. You can't close the spline. Close the spline is not the way it works. You have to crop it on one side and crop in the other, and the optical illusion is what combines them. Just to prove it, I will close the spline, and it's not it's gonna get nuts there because you've got this super long line that's gonna twist in between them, so that gets super messed up. So you can't do that. We do want it to crop like that. In fact, I'm shocked that I don't even know how that's working, how that's cropping really cleanly like that. Clamp is great, but we need it to Go negative. Does that make sense? Strength 200%. Whoa. No. If we put two of them, how can you rewind it on the spline? Just let me think a little bit. That gets cropped off. And it rolls around, which is exactly what we want. We just need more of it appearing from the start as it goes. But those would have had to have been negative. From, to, from, and to, to, and from. I mean, I should be able to just stretch it. No, okay, okay, okay. So if we from and to double it, double it. Okay, so we double it. Double, double, double it. Turn off the spline for a moment. Twice the text. I'm just going to eyeball it, which could be a problem, but we'll see. We'll see if it's close. From and to double it. And now, yeah, now we can go negative. I shouldn't have changed my camp. There we go. Oh, look. Look. That's pretty good. Now, minus 100 is where it will break. So we want to go from minus 50 at the beginning. The beginning is minus 50. Record. The end is positive 50. Now, does that have to be even longer? Oh, it looks like we can go to net. Okay, 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 okay. We can go to negative 100. I'll grab my first keyframe, and that should go from negative 100, and then it ends on zero. Boom. So let's see what that does. Hey, I think that might be it. Cause yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Ha 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 ha. Uh, da, 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 da. I didn't think we'd get it, but we got it. Let's see, make sure our perspective is good. We'd have to line that up really 
pretty sharp. Also, we probably have to scale it a little bit depending on how much the perspective is. If we go full, if we went full isometric, which we could, but I'm, I don't want to. Uh, if we go full isometric, it'd be super flat. But if we just eyeball that and place it in the proper spot, it's not super perfect. And I also didn't stretch it, so it's not necessarily going to perfectly, perfectly line up. And let's see, that spline, I kind of like the entire thing to be a little bit fatter to match maybe the reference. So can we scale our spline down and not break? Yeah, there we go. So we're not breaking a perspective. Now we just zoom up, which does also doesn't break the perspective. Moving our camera will a little bit, but we just, oh, it's super fiddly. Yeah, there we go. So now look, it's both coming and going the opposite direction and it spins and now that looks it gets big oh i i didn't think we'd figure it out and i can't believe that the 90 degree turn was exactly what we needed so i think we nailed it really cool animation though empty it was a, a challenging one i didn't think we'd get it and we got it i'm super happy um so i like the challenge did i um seems like there's two of these on top of each other I don't want to lose my camera angle, though, so we'll make a camera there. Whoa, look at this crazy perspective we got. It gets bigger as it goes further. I guess it doesn't get bigger, probably stays the same, but it's tricking my eye. Anyway, that's pretty cool. Why does it... I mean, I'm sure you see it, too. It feels like there's um intersecting geometry there. It doesn't render, though, so it might just be the way it's twisting. do 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 do, 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 do. And we just got all this text. Do we have it twice? Yeah, Rocket Lasso Live, Rocket Lasso Live. Makes sense to have doubled it because the line was longer. Oh, yeah, we had to double the line. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, and, yeah, we should have all the options to so still add the rounding in. We can bevel that. That'll make everything slower, of course. But let's put one sharp bevel on it. The new bevels in R21 are amazing if you haven't played with the bevels in r21 it's a huge feature hide the spline make a nice color let's get a bright rocket lasso orangey color Meep. whoops put it on the no Oh, yeah, that's cool. Uh, super duper fun. Thank you so much for that question. Let's save this. We finally, it is very, very, very rare to get an optical illusion question. Uh, and let's figure it out. From MT. Um, but that was a cool one. I'm... I'm always pleased when I have no idea how to do it. And before we get to the end, we figure it out. And it's funny how your instincts are. Like, I'm right there. I'm, I'm right there with everybody as everybody's, like, shouting ideas. Like, oh, twist it 90 degree. Or, you know, twist, uh, like, put a twist on it. Or, um, or it's just really straightforward. It's like, no, it's not. That's not where the perspective comes in. Um, so, yeah. And, I mean, it, like I said, if we just, if we scaled our rock, our, Motex perfectly that would go but yeah it's actually an incredibly clean rig as well all it was was twisting that spline perfectly to make it look like a circle even though whoop, it's not um yeah <laughs> thanks so much uh oh sage thanks for making it in uh i don't know if you've been lurking or if you only just made it right here at the end when i'm saying goodbye in fact i think it is time to say goodbye to everyone couple important details first of all if you're in chicago there's a meetup tonight which should be fun a good place with good beer and fish and chicken should be delicious i am looking forward to it and then i put together this that i wanted to just make sure i give my proper shout outs to everybody so let me make sure that there's no audio going right now which is good so i'm gonna turn this on and uh, i just want to do a big thank you for everybody who's been supporting on patreon it's been really amazing i was really bad about getting the credits put together so here is everyone who has supported on patreon so far mm -hmm.